Hello. Hello. Okay. We're back and I think we can continue. Hope everybody is fine and had a good coffee and a good coffee break, of course. <laughs> okay. That was some reverberation, some evoc potentials there. Okay, so we back, we back, back on filters, and we will be very short on that. Just to say that all filters that you can think of are a combination of low pass and high pass filters. So low pass filters, they let go, they let through the low amplitude and they cut off the high amplitude. High pass filters is the inverse, they let pass the high frequencies and cut off the low frequencies. And you can combine them and make a band pass filter or inverse it into the very well known notch filter that we all know to eliminate our line noises. But the important fact to, to remind you is this one. And especially this, I will try to, to show it here and B. This is the influence of the high pass filter on our amplitude of the evoke potential. So the high pass filter is taking out low frequencies. And if you have, this is a P300. If you have a P300, you see that the amplitude of your eventuate potential is going down dramatically with your high pass filter, with the cutoff frequency of your high pass filter. While the low pass filter will have influence on the on the setup, on the on the offset of the potential. So it will it will change, it will have influence on the latency, but the high pass filter will have a lot of influence on the amplitude. That is something you have to recall because you these high pass filters you can set yourself. And if you take a, a wrong uh, somebody wants to admit, he's in the waiting room, welcome. If you take a wrong number here, you can have a quite dramatical effect and come to the wrong clinical conclusions. For instance, here you can see if you have a cutoff frequency of 0 0.1 hertz, you have a practically normal uh, amplitude. But if you do cut a frequency of one hertz, you can see the amplitude of this uh, potential going down at more than, than 60%. So take care of your high pass filters. High pass filters are very useful, but you must be very uh, aware of their effect on amplitude and on latency, because here too you can see there will be a, a variation in the measured latency depending on these filter values. Okay, let's come to a bit more clinical uh, applications of these uh, all common types of event-related potentials. They are summarized here in this slide, and it, I think it's a useful slide to, to have a survey. It, it will be sent to you also, and we will start with a P50. Now, P50 is a quite a strange uh, uh, strange duck, strange duck, because normally we would put it into the realm of neurology. Yeah? It's, it's less than 100 milliseconds. It's a, a potential that falls about 50 milliseconds. So yet we see phenomenon in this in this event-related potential or in this evoked potential, how you call it, that are very important and that are reflected in some clinical conditions like schizophrenia. We can see that the suppression, and I will tell you what suppression is in P50 is very frequently seen in autism and schizophrenia. Uh, it's related to a defect in the nicotine alpha-7 receptor and could be an explanation, could be an explanation why a lot of these patients and everybody with experience in, in residential psychiatry knows that uh, uh, patients with, with schizophrenia, they like to smoke. It's very difficult to, to, to ban the cigarette from, from the psychiatric clinic. And when I was doing P50, so if a patient had smoked a cigarette less than a half an hour before the measurement of the evoked potential, I could not trust it anymore. So it, you need to have it without patients smoking cigarettes. It's, it's really a very good um, biomarker of the alpha-7 nicotine receptor. It's a very simple potential. You just give two uh, noises, two, two tones to stimuli, like tok tok. Two equals stimuli, tok tok, tok tok, tok tok. Now the brain is by definition an economical, some say a lazy organ, we say an economical organ. When it gets the second impulse, the second stimulus, 
it knows that it already heard it and it will devote less energy to the second one. So you will see like a suppression of the second one related to the first one. So here we have this P50 on the first stimulus, which has a nice amplitude. It's not much, eh? it's only, you see, this is two microvolts. So this whole thing is not more than two microvolts. This is very low. The P50 is very low potential. And here the second one on the second stimulus is even lower. So you have this phenomenon of suppression of the P50 from the first to the second stimulus in the region it's about 50 milliseconds and we take about between 40 and, and 70 or 80 milliseconds to measure the peak amplitude and uh, correlated to this one of the second stimulus. Something that people are not very well aware of is that in contrast with all the other event related potentials like P300, CNV, P, uh, P600 and, and 400, this is not formed by slow activity, this is formed by 40 hertz gamma. So be aware of your filter settings. If you set your low pass filter uh, too high, uh, then you will cut it out. It's gamma activity, 40 Hertz. P50 are 40 Hertz. That's the way I recall it. So here again, when doing a P40, take care of your filters. Filter settings are important because they have influence on your amplitude of the uh, potential. So this is a P50 and here is the second one. As you can see, it's lower. Let me show you some of the potential uh, I used uh, in, in time. There was a, a company called, uh, 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 how was it called? Uh, Cognitrace. Cognitrace was a system that uh, measured these evoked potential. They no longer support it. ANT. ANT no longer supports it. But it was a very, a bit peculiar, but a very good system. First of all, because it allowed sequential averages. Every eight traces were averaged sequentially. So you could very well see the habituation of the potential. You see the amplitude going down. You see the habituation is a real occurring phenomenon. Eh? The, the amplitude of the event-related potential is not staying the same all the time. And here, strangely enough, the P50, which we would normally uh, categorize as neurological, is following habituation as in psychiatry, as in event-related potential. So that's why we take P50 into our, we take it from neurology back to psychiatry. Sorry, neurologists, online we use it. And here you see the first, this is the average, the, the complete average of the S1, the first stimulus, the first TOC, and the red one here is the second TOC. And you see there is a practically perfect suppression of the first in comparing to the second. This was a normal patient. Here again, we have a normal suppression. You have the first one, the blue one here, and then the second stimulus, the S2, which is very low. So it's a very nice suppression. You can quantify it. And you see the S1 is about four uh, microvolts and the S2 is about 1.2 microvolts. Again, and here you have a patient with a very low suppression here is maybe some suppression that is very hard to see. So here we say this is a very low suppression. This could be a patient for possibly with schizophrenia or autism or one of these defects of sensory gating. Right? It's a potential of sensory gating. There's something wrong with sensory gating in schizophrenia. We also see it in the visual evoked potential. The visual evoked potentials we can already see structural defects at the P1 level, at the very first uh, uh, visual component. The, there are problems there that give reflections in symptomatology later on. And saying that schizophrenia is purely a psychological or a psychiatric disorder is clearly uh, invalid because there are structural uh, def defects already that can be measured at very early stages of our evoked potentials uh, here and the and another strange phenomenon that uh, is non back to the realm of neurology is that sometimes you can see that the S2, it's an inverted effect. The, 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 the energy that goes into the second stimuli is higher than the first. It's inverted, uh, it's not suppression, it's uh, amplification. And this is a condition that I have seen many, many, many times in migraine patients. And, I, and it's not a, a trait, it, it's not a state, it's a trait phenomenon. And I remember a lot of patients where I saw this and 
that I didn't know they, they had migraine in the family. And when I uh, inquired about it, and, and practically every time you could hear, oh, yes, my father, my mother, uh, when I was a child, they had migraine attacks. Uh, so it's a, it's a very, another kind of biomarker for migraine. Yeah? It's very uh, useful. I think Professor Schoenen has worked a lot on this uh, P50 phenomenon in migraine. But I'm not. I have not purchased that very much. I don't know if it uh, if it varies with therapy or not. Uh, I, I just use it as a biomarker. Error-related negativity that Christoph has also talked about this this morning. That is a very early potential. It, it takes. You can see the negativity here. Negativity again is up. You can see it in in a window of around 50 milliseconds when we make an error. When we make a conscious error. We, we do something and then we say, oh, oh, this was a, I was wrong, I was wrong. Well, the brain gives you this error signal already uh, around 50 milliseconds. I, it's something that we used in our brain computer interface because we use it as a reset. Because in the brain computer interface, we have a whole sequence of events going on. And if it's wrong, if the, 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 the steering signal was wrongly interpreted, then we have this event related negativity that we could use to reset the system instead of doing it the whole sequence. So that was a little trick that we used. We have the error-related negativity and what people tend to forget is there's also an error-related much more pronounced, much broader positivity. And if you can see the, the ACME, the, the, the spot in, in the brain map is especially here at the place of the ACC, the anterior singular cortex, is the place where this error-related negativity is uh, generated. Error-related negativity is a member of a whole family of error negativities. It can be feedback negativity. You can, you can look at error-related negativity in other people. It's a very interesting experiment is to do an error-related negativity in a patient where he looks at the screen where another one is making errors. So there you can control the error rate because normally uh, you have to give him a paradigm that the patient makes errors. Normally, patients don't make errors. They, they try to do the, the test correctly. So you have to enforce them. You have to stress them so that they make errors. Another way to do is to look at the screen where you have, a let's say, a video where somebody makes deliberate errors. The patient sees that the other one makes an error. So he has a feedback and you see the error-related negativity. Uh, it would be very interesting to see if some kind of psychiatric conditions like uh, autism or like maybe psychopathy, see this, have the same reaction, yes or no. All research projects. Here you see it in OCD patients where it's very pronounced and this is obviously one of the psychiatric conditions where you have these very pronounced event uh, error related negativity potentials. Again, uh, this is a trial. These are the correct trials. There is a slight negativity in the correct trials. It's a correct trial negativity, but in the error, the, PIF, the, the amplitude, and this is false around 50 milliseconds, is much higher. And you have also this very pronounced error related positivity. Uh, it's often we, you recognize it better here than there because the, all this also is very low. Eh? It's, uh, we are here in the order of two to three microvolts, and this is very, very low. And related very clearly, if you do source analysis, if you look at the component, eh, to, to speak in Stephen Lux language, that generates the uh, potential, then we see it's very clearly related to the anterior singular cortex. Our P300, the, the, the main, the best known of all uh, evoked event related potential, I would say evoked potential, event related potentials, the P300. Here again, I take my positivity down and negativity up. Sorry, Christoph. I used the same slide that Christoph used. I lent, I stole it, I stole it from Christoph with the X's and the O's. He already talked about the, the two baskets where the X's and the O's come in. And the, the, the number of rare stimuli, the, this is about 15 to 20% of the total number of stimuli. But what also is important is that the sequence must be irregular. And the irregularity the, the, uh, of the sequence will determine, will have a large uh, influence on the amplitude of the P300. 
And again, we have this ensemble averaging from the X and the O basket and two averages, the one with and uh, the one uh, for the rare stimulus. Here you have uh, from my own system that I use in, in my practice, uh, I have always the, the reaction times because when the patient presses the button on the recognition of the rare stimulus, you can also use this to measure reaction times. And these reaction times are very nicely, they have a very good vigilance, they're very constant, and they are below 300 milliseconds as they should be. And you can see here the P300. Here we have one single peak. It's not possible here to recognize uh, a P3A and a P3B. In the next patient, for instance, here, you will see that this is very clearly a P3A and a P3B. The P3B is even uh, on the verge of abnormality. It's around 400 milliseconds. So for this age and, and sex, it was 400 was about the, the border of two standard deviations of normality. So here we have at the range while the P3A is very normal. P3E is here. It's a very normal and you can see it uh, here and there. And at the same time, you can see that its reaction times are very erratic. And there are a lot of reactions that are above 300 milliseconds. So this was a, indeed a patient with ADHD. He had attention deficit disorder. There was nothing wrong with his recognition of novel stimuli. His P3A, his dopaminergic system was completely normal, but his memory and his classification, his recognition system, was slow. He made errors. Eh? He made errors. The errors were filtered out here, but he made also a lot of errors. So what is important is that already, even if you do not see the patient and you see a pattern like this, you can already deduct an, a number of uh, parameters, a number of uh, attributes about the mental condition of this patient. You can see that maybe it has ADD or maybe it took too much uh, benzodiazepines or too much medication. Both conditions are possible or he didn't sleep for two nights. That's possible too. But you see that is vigilance is uh, the energy, the amplitude and the latency of his P300 are, are slightly abnormal. So I would take care if this guy has to to, to, to drive a car or uh, use uh, complex machinery, for instance, or be a flight controller. I would not trust him as a flight controller, but he has a normal dopaminergic system. These components we've seen, I will not come back. This is the P1, Christophe spoke about it. This is the P300, uh, we, we've seen this. This is just for illustration. I will now go to another potential, another one in the series, which is the mismatch negativity. What is mismatch negativity? Here we use an acoustic paradigm where we have from time to time one stimulus who has a slightly abnormality in that could be amplitude, that could be duration, and uh, if you look at the literature it is clearly the duration of the stimulus is the most important parameter that generates the highest mismatch negativity. It is important that this is a pre-attentive uh, uh, potential. It is already present even if the patient is not consciously attending the series of stimuli. It is like a, a sequence of, of all equal stimuli, but from time to time there's one who differs a little, little bit. And if you are really concentrating, you can hear it, you can train yourself to hear it, but if you're not, uh, I, I let patients look at the TV screen and I see a movie without, without noise, of course, because they, they have these headphones on. And uh, the stimuli take about five minutes. You, you need a lot of them. And then we see that uh, the brain does detect this abnormality in a series. The brain detects abnormalities and will generate, when it detects something abnormal, when it detects an error, something that is out of order of normality, it will generate a negative potential. And here it's a mismatch, right? called mismatch, around 200 milliseconds between 160 and 220 milliseconds. Now, this is a quite an important potential also in neurology, because if we have patients in a coma, uh, a lot of times people and their family and friends will ask how long will this coma last and it's very difficult to say we can say clinically when the coma is superficial uh, we have the criteria the uh, patient will awake but if we have a patient in coma and he generates a mismatch negativity you can be certain that he will be awake within one week 
So it's a very simple trick, a very simple potential to determine the prognosis of the wake-up time of a coma patient. You will not be able to predict his, his condition on awakening. He could have serious defects, but you can say to the family, he will be awake within a week. And if you don't see the mismatch, you can't say anything. So it's a very simple way. It's a, the same thing they use in, in uh, newly born children to see if they're hearing, if their cortical hearing is intact. And this is mismatch negativity. Very easy to do, a bit, a bit monotone. Eh? It's always, it looks like the same stimulus all the time. And, uh, but very practical to, to uh, again here, for instance, in patients with anxiety, with high arousal, with, with OCD, you will have a large mismatch negativity. Always saw it in patients with psychotraumata, with PTSD, patients who are very vigilant and they, they detect abnormalities uh, quite, their brain detects the abnormalities quite easily. So why are they interesting? These are slides that are, I borrowed from Thomas and maybe Thomas already talked about them, but I think they are interesting because they give us a way of detecting mental states without the conscious, without the need of conscious cooperation by the patient. And you can do this with, with question, with lists of, of questions and questionnaires and, and score lists and all these things. But here they are very subjectively influenced why in a P300, why in a mismatch negativity and a P50, you have a much more objective, much more patient independent way of discovering these intermediate states of uh, mental activity. Of course, you must be able to detect the difference between trait and state. I, have a, I had a patient who had a bipolar disorder. He was a lawyer and he had a very, very, very deep depressional face. And he was convinced, it was like a little delusional thinking that uh, he was, uh, uh, he had this all his life. And he said, well, even as a student, I have a very difficult in concentrating and I'm still wondering how I ever got my diploma. And I argued with him and said, well, they don't give this diploma if you don't do a good examination. So at that time you were normal and he, he doubted that very much. And when we did a PG-100, there was a very, very, very low amplitude. So he, his cognitive function at that time, he had a practically a pseudo dementia due to the very deep depression. And then when his depression cleared, finally, after two years, his depression cleared. And then I asked him when he was normal and when the depression was gone, can I please do another PG-100 to see the evolution? And then I saw a practically completely normal PG-100. So I knew that this was a state parameter of the depression, not a trait parameter of a genetic condition. But like say the P50 inverse of suppression is a trait parameter of migraine. So you must take the difference clinically to the state and trait and often by controlling it sequentially, you can see this. For instance, I had a, a friend, a colleague who had an actually was a neuropsychiatrist and he had a, an accident. He had a, a, a car hitting him from behind and he had a very small, very small whiplash with a, not much discomfort, some pain in the neck, but not very much because he even didn't want uh, x-rays to be taken. He was no, no loss of consciousness. And he came to see me, I think a week or two later, um, because his, his accident was a bit, uh, he was doing 30 miles an hour when he had an accident. So we laughed about it. But then two weeks later, he, he said, well, I have trouble uh, concentrating on what patients saying, and I can do that for the first two, three patients, but then it's, it's, it's getting worse and I had to rest and go to bed. And it's, it's so strange because I don't know what causes this. So I did a PG-100 and I saw that is amplitude. Amplitude is the, the number of cognitive resources you have. And the amplitude is very low. And I did this, another one two months later and six months later when he was completely normal, he could do all his patients. And we saw that the amplitude of the PG-100 went up. So even if, Clinically, neurologically, uh, we, we did uh, even MRI. There was nothing abnormal to be seen. His EG was completely normal. We saw on the evoked potentials on the PG-100 that there was indeed something wrong with his, his power, his concentration, his, his cognitive resources. And the amplitude of the PG-100 is like an index of cognitive resources. The latency is an index of the speed of activating these resources. So the amplitude and the latency have different clinical meanings. And that's very important in the uh, clinical 
uh, translation of these and the translation of these potentials to the clinical field. And there's a lot of conditions, I will not enumerate them all, Thomas has done this this morning, where you can use these uh, potentials, of course. Some general remarks, eh? we, we, we know that there's a lot of research going on and eh? evoke potentials and event related potential is not a, a closed chapter, it's an ongoing domain of active research and we will see some of these examples. And a lot of this research is done in the Faculty of Experimental Psychology. That's why, that's the reason that I really wanted psychologists in my team, because they are doing the research, they are trying new paradigms. And when these paradigms are important in studies and in double blind studies to the clinical field, then we, we must be able to port them in the clinical field. And there has been a lot of problems there because a lot of producers of devices and software, they made only one stimulation paradigm. A lot of PG-100 stimulation paradigms are just the oddball paradigm. And the two tones, a, a, a common one and a rare one, and that's it. And later on as a user, if you want to imply the new uh, the new um, findings of research into your clinical field, it's often very difficult to adapt the stimulus uh, generating system or the analysis system. So you need software that is on one way, on one hand, that is quite robust and quite uh, standardized, but on the other hand, allow you as a clinician to adapt your system to, to, to grow with your system and adapt it to the findings in the in, from research. So there are, of course, there are excellent uh, packages. Eh? Nick Dogris has one, uh, Stephen Luck has ERP Lab. ERP Lab, ladies and gentlemen, is completely free. It's completely uh, written in MATLAB. It's fantastic, but I cannot use it in the clinical um, setting. First of all, to use software and hardware in clinical setting must be certified. Second, the ERP Lab allows you to set every parameter. But if you have to do this for every patient that comes in, then it's very difficult first to work in a standard way so that you can do clinical studies. If you do clinical studies, you must be sure that there's no variance due to technical factors. That's one. So secondly, if you have to tune all parameters for one patient and you have 10 patients waiting in your waiting room, uh, this will not be possible. So you have to have a, a practical system that you can use, put on the electrode, start the, the recording, that's what I need in my practice. Yet, if new paradigms come up, and I will show you some, then you must be have a system that's flexible enough to uh, be configured in a new way without you having to pay a complete new system. I show you uh, I show you a new development in P three hundred. Then before we have this these two stimulus oddball paradigm, still very valid, eh? still very valid. But uh, one of the big names in uh, P three hundred research was John Polich, and John Polich has has written some very nice uh, survey articles on on P three hundred, and he saw that there was a very important P three A, and P three A was before it was called the novelty P three hundred. It's a front, front of central peak, it's that first peak of the P300, the, the, the P3A, and this is, this is determined by dopaminergic uh, neurons, while the P3B, that is more memory-based, is more noradrenergic. So these two peaks have a completely different clinical uh, reflection, a clinical meaning. And what Polish said is, in order to extract them optimally, you need in fact, a three-way paradigm. You need a frequent stimulus and a rare stimulus that should not be too different. Nowadays, our rare and common stimulus are very different. It's an X and an O, very clearly different. It's a tok 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 versus a tok tok tick tok, very different. But in the Polish, uh, your patient must concentrate on the difference between the frequent and the rare. So he must remember, he must concentrate, he must pay attention to the difference. This, this will increase his P3B. And from time to time, he sets in a very strange stimulus that's completely new, completely different, like breaking glass, the sound of glass, the sound of a, a dog barking, something very strange, very out of the order, very novel, and that will generate the novelty P3A. And this novelty P3A has a completely different uh, uh, location and meaning. I'll show it a bit later on.
A new development has done here in Brussels by uh, a friend of mine who's uh, uh, Salvatore Campanella. He's a clinical psychologist and neuropsychologist who has a lab that is working in a university hospital in Brussels, Bregman Hospital, where he has done multimodal stimulation. So he has paired sound and image and he has made congruent pairings like a uh, male figure who says with a male voice, speaks with a male voice. He used the French word papier, yeah, paper, and then he had a male uh, face with a female voice. So there was a, a slight oddball situation there. And uh, what was very important is that with this bimodal stimulation, he could detect preclinical depressive situations in a very early stage. So there was research with an immediate impact on the clinic, but you need a system that is flexible enough, like Capito, that's flexible enough so that you yourself can do this pairing of the stimuli as you like. And if you're dependent on a software producer or a hardware producer who gives you a program and that's it, like I had in my ANT system, which okay, it was a good system, I don't critic it, but I could not adapt it. And that's why it stopped at the final, at the end of the road, I could not change it anymore. So that was a very pity situation, of course. And it is used PT-100 in forensic, like lie detection, guilty knowledge, vigilance evaluation, uh, and all kind of other conditions where you can use the... Uh... Well, here you have the article, I put it here, the article of John Polish, which uh, he's working at Scripps in La Jolla, California, and this already dates from 2007, but still a very good survey on the difference of P3A and P3B. And here you see, for instance, his P3A paradigm here, which is a bit more early than the P3B, which comes a bit later. This is a P3A, this is a P3B, and then here. And you can see that the P3E has maximum amplitude more in the frontocentral part uh, amplitude, while at uh, P3B is more pronounced in the, let's say, central parietal, eh? P3A frontocentral, P3B uh, central parietal uh, level. Again, match control. Uh, we have here the P3A, which in match control is very clearly here, and the P3B is more posterior, and there's not much difference, but of course you see the difference. If you look at Parkinson on the right, you see that the P3A is practically absent, and that's very important because Parkinson is dopaminergic, and P3A is a dopaminergic potential. The P3B is also uh, attenuated. We know that in Parkinson we have memory problems, we have cognitive problems, but it's less than the P3A. So you can use this PGA to diagnose. And if you look at a condition like restless leg syndrome, that is very well also related to dopaminergic deficits in the spinal cord, you can see that the influence is practically, especially on the PGA and much less on the PGB. So here again, you have a clinical illustration of the fact that your PGA has another meaning, another reflection, dopaminergic meaning, while PGB is. So while these two potentials come very close together in the PG-100 complex, they should be uh, measured separately, if possible, if your system allows it, to have this much more um, nuanced, uh, very more much nuanced image of this neurotransmission defects or normality. Here was work of, again, by, by uh, Salvatore Campanella on people with binge drinking. And again, you can see that the P3A is a very good, uh, will differentiate binge drinking from non-binge drinking. Yeah? It's, it's the, the P3A that is very clearly developed, while uh, in non-binge drinkers, it's practically uh, absent. So we see th these are all the same, saying that P3A is more Fronto central P3B is more centro parieto temporal in origin. There is a difference in origin. If you look at the sources of the uh, uh, potential, you can see that there's a difference. The same, the same thing here PGE, PGB, more parieto temporal, more fronto central than the other ones. And this is the uh, 
publication of Salvatore Campanella with, uh, with uh, Eberg's together with a neurologist. Uh, Hendrik is a neurologist. And uh, this is the article in Clinical Neurophysiology where he explains the technicity, which is very simple, of the bimodal PG100 of ball component. And here you can see his results, which are very illustrative. If you look at the, I have to take this away, if you look only at the auditory uh, potential in red, it's here, the PG100 is here. If you look at the visual, it's a bit higher, okay, here. But if you look at the bimodal, the combined, you see the highest PG100 value. It's the best discriminator for subclinical uh, depressions. That was very important. Uh, other people have also developed programs for uh, um, event-related potentials. This is the uh, program that was developed in the, uh, in the in the system, the NeuroGuide system from Dr. Robert Thatcher. It was programmed by a friend of mine called uh, um, uh, oh my god, his name, I, I will come to that, I forgot his name for the moment, sorry. Um, it's a very nice, um, uh, Ernesto, Ernesto Palmero Soler. Ernesto Palmero used to work for ENT and he programmed a lot of in event related potential software for ENT and now he did it for the, uh, in the NeuroGuide system. It's nice because if you do it in 19 channels you can use it to measure the components. But again, this is a, a good illustration that even the, the best analysis software in the world will fail if you don't have a good stimulation presentation software and if you don't have a good link of timing and synchronicity between the stimulus and the analysis. Because already there is variation, there is jitter. If you look at these potentials, this, these are not really good potentials. This, this is a bit of noise. So this is just for illustration purposes. You need the, the best analysis software in the world will never compensate for trouble in synchronization. You need a system that will match your screen, match your audio to the, to the real stimulus. And that, that if you don't have it, you can have the best analysis software in the world. It will only generate uh, rubbish. Again, ERP Lab, uh, a lot of people know ERP Lab. It's free, it's, it's powerful. You can add MATLAB routines to it, but you see every parameter has to be set and, and it's, it's a lot of work. Eh? It's good for research. I think for research is fine for research, but if you want to do clinical research and work on a lot groups of patients, you need a system that is uh, more handy that that comes in more handy and yet yet has the flexibility to adapt to modern research so as a last slide i want to say what what is the road ahead what are the conclusions well we can say that erps are a very valuable tool in monitoring many if not all cognitive of cognitivo affective symptoms in the psychiatric clinic and a lot of conditions you can use the same technique to monitor the system transversely between conditions, that you have some, need some knowledge on the, the differences between EPs in the field of neurology and ERPs in the field of uh, psychology and psychiatry, because the dynamic behavior of ERPs are quite different from the ones that we use in neurology. And this has practical implication and technical implications in the measurement system. And in order to be able to incorporate, and this is a, a recall of what I just said, the latest developments of this ERP research that is going on, and there's a lot of research in ERP, fortunately, we need a package that is flexible and adaptable to these new findings. And that is yet accurate, but also that can give us, uh, 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 that can be deployed in a clinical setting. And if in a clinical setting, we, we want to use ERP lab, it's, it's, it will be not very practical. It's very good software. I don't, I don't criticize it. It's very good software. I've used it myself, but in a clinical field, I must put able put up the electrode, start the stimulator, do the measurement. That is what I need if I want to do eight or 10 or 20 patients uh, uh, ERPs in, in, a, in a group. But 
of course, when my friend uh, Campanella tells me that B-modal stimulation is more sensible to detect depression, I want a system where I can implement it. And in my system that I use until now, the ENT system, that was it. I could not adapt it anymore. And, and that was a, a barrier. And I think that with, with Thomas' system, one, one of the, the very strong points of the system of Thomas is that this barrier falls, is, is gone. People can adapt it to their needs, to the software, to the research they want, and yet keep this very handy, practical system that can be deployed in a clinical setting.